Hello, welcome to theCUBE's coverage here in Seattle. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE. Really get digging into the reInvent coverage. We're here in the Seattle headquarters of AWS. The building's name is reInvent. We're going to get a preview and dig deep into the news and analysis at, at reInvent. Dave Brown, who runs Compute for AWS. Great to see you, CUBE alumni. We have a prop you're going to bring up here. Good to see you. Yeah, great, John. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. So, well, thanks for coming to visit us at reInvent. <laughs> this is a home reinvent game for you. <laughs> this is almost an away game for me. It's a home <laughs> game for you guys, as they say in sports. Yeah. You know, you're in the hottest area right now. You oversee uh, what is the most in demand right now, which is I need horsepower to run stuff, train stuff, make inference, um, semiconductor businesses. You're seeing the custom silicon coming out. You know, there's a real emphasis. And by the way, developers are going down to the machine level yeah. to get advantages at the yeah. chip level. Yeah. I haven't seen that, it's like reverse. It's like, they're supposed to go up the stack. No, they're going down yes. Yes. because, you know, small ball or small code is very efficient. Yeah. Because it's not to maximize resources, it's actually to get productivity yeah. performance. Yeah, well, performance is everything at the moment, as we've seen with large language models and, you know, both in the training and the inference. You're right, developers are getting all the way down to the silicon and starting to think about exactly what they need to do to get the code there and get the performance. Um, but it's, you know, it's a story that um, sort of follows on some, from something that we've seen at AWS really since the very start. And you know, one of the things that has driven us as a cloud provider has been how do we give customers more performance for every dollar spent? It's a very simple formula. Internally, we call it price performance. Um, but it really is that. It's, you know, it's really a follow on from Moore's Law, uh, you know, even though Moore's Law isn't really a thing anymore in the way that it was defined. Um, but customers do expect more performance for every dollar spent. And, um, it's been an algorithm that has driven us you know, to not only innovate at the hypervisor level, but all the way down into the silicon level. And um, you know, that's what we're seeing a lot of today is the you know, on there. I remember when you guys, a couple of game changing moments for AWS history was one, a couple you know, notables was obviously the CIA thing when IBM sued. That, that's, <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that opened up the whole CIA. Wow, cloud's actually bigger. And when you guys started putting out your numbers, and it was infrastructure as a service when you started to um, um, break them out from the Amazon earnings. Everyone was, wow, there's a real business there. It's mostly infrastructure as a service. It was the bread and butter, the core yeah, services. Yeah. And then the past layer, the higher level services, yeah. just continues, like a, yeah. it grew yeah. big time. So we saw the enablement. Yeah. It was disruptive enablement That's because right. it was creating right. disruption in a good way. It was enabling <laughs> disruption. And the interesting about, you know, the thing about sort of, you know, as you say, we put out our numbers and people were like, hey, wow, this is actually a, a growing business and a big business was I think, you know, if you go back to 2006, 2007, 2008, there was a lot of debate about whether the cloud could really deliver the performance that was needed to actually run a lot of what, you know, customers at the time, or, you know, enterprises at the time called bare metal uh, performance. And could the hypervisor actually deliver performance that you could run all of these enterprise scale applications on? And it was through the innovation, you know, it's not when we started in 2006 with our compute service, but through the innovation that we did, and our willingness to go to any level of the stack that really allowed us to continue to win these customer workloads, and, and we're still doing that today, right? If you look at our latest tri chips that we put in out there, it's the same journey of understanding what customers need, working out how do we innovate all the way down to the silicon, and then putting something out there that gives them better price performance. Yeah, and we've, we've been saying for many years on theCUBE, hardware matters, yeah. when everyone's like, Let's talk, don't talk about speeds and fees, talk about solutions. <laughs> No, no, it's hardware matters because performance, you know, the gamers wanted the best graphics cards, yes. the crypto guys wanted the GPUs to, yes. to mine Bitcoin, now you need GPUs yes. to run the Gen AI. So clearly we are in a hardware accelerated model of accelerated computing, and you guys have always led the pack um, in the infrastructure side, and, and the old guard was always building longer cycles to build stuff, so you guys shortened that down and innovated. So two questions for you. This year, how are you seeing those cycles of release of, of new chips, one, happening, and then the, the innovation, the, the, the value coming out of it. Can you share your thoughts on yeah, that? Yeah, absolutely. How Gen AI has impacted that, those, the price performance, which is the speed and fees, but also the cycle times to get yeah. shipped yeah. out better hardware. Yeah. yeah, so I mean, cycle time in hardware is, is challenging, because any mistake and you're adding a minimum of six months to the schedule, and we've seen that recently in, with some other, some other companies, but, um, it's something that when we, you know, when we started our journey with Nitro all the way back to in 2014, 2015, we started to get really good at building silicon uh, and knowing that that silicon is actually going to be correct before we tape it out. Um, and we were actually able to use AWS to do that. So given that we had this enormous uh, compute service, we were able to use that compute to actually validate 
um, you know, the, the CPU or the chip that we were building at the time. Um, and that became very true of Graviton as well. If you remember, you know, first Graviton was 2018, 2019, then we very quickly, you know, in our fourth generation, we, we announced last year at reInvent, um, and it's now, you know, in instance types being used by customers, growing really well. Um, but those are four generations in really about six yeah. years. And so it's like every 18 months or so. Um, and more importantly is our ability to be successful with that silicon, to build the right thing that customers are going to need to get it right the first time, uh, because it's really mistakes that slow things down. Um, now, you know, one of the things that Matt just announced at reInvent uh, today uh, is our Tronium 2 accelerator, which we spoke about last year, but it's now generally available uh, to customers to actually go and run their ML workloads on Tronium 2. And while it's the same recipe that we've used all along, price performance, how do we improve the hardware to give that level of performance at a lower price, um, you know, going after generative AI workloads and with Tranium 2, you know, I actually have one of the chips with me here today. And it's called T2, but shorthand. Yeah, we call it TRN2. TRN2 is okay. the name of the instance, and so you'll see instance types called TRN2. Um, T2, we actually have already. That's one of our, okay. our early uh, instances. If Had we known we were going to have Tranium, <laughs> we may have saved the, number, the letter. <laughs> okay. um, but, uh, yeah, so that's the chip. That it's, it's our most complicated chip that we've built. Yeah. Um, and a TRN2 instance actually has 16 of those chips. Um, built into the instance that are all connected with our Neuralink protocol, so you, you can treat all 16 of those accelerators as you know a single memory. Okay, you're, going, you're going too fast here. So I'm, am I getting too fast? Yes. <laughs> what is on this chip? I can see. Um, yeah, so that's that's obviously all the chiplets and the various bits of technology that uh, go into making sure that we can deliver the you know the processing power that's required to do generative AI, which is a lot of high it. bandwidth memory. All there's, the there's there's well, definitely HBM memory, um, you know, and that that goes into this. Uh, so it's got you know all the latest technology that's built into that, um, and and making sure that we can we can run all of these latest. Okay, scope the scope the um, performance gains here on price performance because that's a concern. People, you know, we're in the post ZERP era, zero interest rates. Everyone knows from the startup yeah. bubble. Um, they're forced to, you know, not they don't have as much cash, but they want to be That's profitable. Right. So, That's right. you know, people don't want to break the bank, or but they want to push the envelope on training. They want to push yeah. the envelope on Gen AI. Yeah. But they want to have yeah. good visibility and cost. What's the price performance of well, that chip? You're absolutely correct. I mean, if generative AI is going to be successful in the long run, we do have to make it more price performance, right? You, you yeah. we have to improve the price performance. Folks need to be able to run inference. Um, or training workloads at a lower cost. And so if we use Tranium 1 as the baseline, this is actually four times just raw performance faster than Tranium 1. Um, so it's a significant improvement on Tranium 1. Um, we think this compared to other types of um, you know, accelerators that we have available in AWS um, will give you about 30 to 40% better price performance. And that's something that we're actually starting to see um, with some of our customers, folks like Poolside and Adobe, um, that have been testing these chips, um, are actually seen about the, that level of price performance about 40%. And you know, w when the numbers are small, 40% uh, is like, okay, I'll save a few thousand dollars, but when the numbers yeah. get really, really large. Give it a use case example of a large number. Give it, give it a use case of a, of well, many, who would many take folks, advantage of Well, many folks, if you look at somebody size, training, petabytes. If, if you look at somebody training a large language model, they, they, they're often using uh, many thousands of these chips. It's working very, very tightly coupled across our elastic fabric adapter network. Um, and so, you know, 40% saving on a cluster of that size is, pr is pretty significant. You know, I wrote, um, putting together a research note here, but I, we wrote a blog post on Silicon Angle, and the title was a little bit of link bait, which we don't like to do, but we wanted to get people's attention. We said, Jamie Dimon's the new competitor to Sam Altman. <laughs> and the context of it was, um, Jamie Dimon obviously runs, you know, J.P. Morgan. Uh, yeah. If you look at the data that they have, yeah. from a petabytes perspective, it's actually bigger than Open AI. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So our thesis yeah. was, hey, yeah. you know, what is he going to do? <laughs> like, yeah. he's one. He's got a limited intellectual property. He's, he's not going to want to put it into Open AI. Yeah. Um, and so yeah. he's, but he's also got the cost challenge. What's his strategy? Yeah. How does he train all that? How does he make that data put to work? Yeah. Because that's a lot of intellectual property. So, yeah, I think JPMC, they're a great AWS customer as well. And um, you know, there's a there's a uh, folks like that in the financial industry, and then just more broadly across the industry. I think many of those enterprises are looking to say, what is their generative AI strategy? I think Jamie Dimon, I'm sure, will be a, a very special case, and will do yeah. something very interesting with the data that he has. Um, but a lot of customers are starting to say, you know, how do I take the data that I have? Um, do I need to build my own model? Um, you know, some of them, we've worked with folks like Databricks that have actually gone and built their own model on AWS and Anthropic's doing that. Um, some of them are saying, hey, there's models like Llama uh, out there that are actually, you know, really, really good and definitely good enough for what I'm doing. So how do I take something like a Llama model and fine tune that model using something yeah. like Tranium um, or, you know, and be able to ultimately get to running inference? And, you know, speaking about those models, yeah. 
latency again, coming back to where you started the conversation, being able to run Llama at, with the best possible latency and the highest throughput in terms of sort of what they call tokens per second, that's something that we actually think that Tranium 2 is going to be the best available uh, on the market um, for those. Uh, you know, I'm smiling workloads. because it's almost like full circle, like old school AWS, <laughs> I didn't even say old school, but <laughs> like, you know, the, one of the benefits of AWS was I want to run my software from that I'm building and I got to put on a server and I would go to get these EC2 yeah. and some storage yeah. and I'm up yeah. off, off to the races. Yeah. Um, Llama was very popular with developers, but they have to host it somewhere. Yes, right? so exactly. Like, I mean, you exactly. got to host that. Exactly. And, and you want to give them choice. And so I think you know that's been our strategy with with custom silicon. Um, you know, we have our own custom silicon, but we still support Nvidia, right? We have yeah. Graviton, but we still support AMD and Intel. And we partner very closely with those 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 partners um, in making sure that their software and their silicon runs best on AWS. Um, and so the, the customers want that choice when they bring a Llama model. So I'm, I'm doing a little white uh, research note on Gen AI. I want to get your thoughts on a paragraph since you're here, since you're an expert. It's called democratizing supercomputing, colon, high performance computing for all, it's a category. The recurring theme in, in the market is democratization of HPC, which essentially was reserved for like the Boeing doing the yeah. big wing design, yeah. hundreds of thousands of compute hours needed, yeah. get in line, it's like time sharing. It's like, can I have yeah. my turn? Yeah. Um, it's tough. <laughs> Enterprises now see the vision of computing options um, for on, on the cloud, in the distributed edge, uh, certainly with computer vision, multimodal, all coming down the pike. The ability to deploy large scale GPU and CPU clusters is now a reality. Um, what, and this, this is what people want to know. How do I stand up? Because you're seeing creativity come for these big opportunities that weren't gettable. So like entrepreneur, I'm just seeing opportunities saying, hey, I'll index the biosphere. Yeah. Like, who would have yeah, thought about yeah, that? Yeah. I have to, yeah. Uh, yeah, good idea, but not yeah. possible yeah. years yeah. ago. Now yeah. you can do things like yeah. that. Hey, I want to solve a complex problem. Yeah. I'm going to need to stand up a supercomputer. Yeah. Exactly. Can, I mean, this is. Take me through that. Like, how do I do that? Yeah. Well, I mean, a large, well, the first problem is getting access to the chips that you need. Yeah. And you know, in the last couple of years with all the supply chain up and downs yeah. that we've seen on a number of different markets, um, that has been one of the, one of the largest challenges yeah. for many customers. So when you talk about democratizing access to chips, um, you know, has been, how do I get access to those? And yeah. we've seen a number of very large players get a large percentage of the chips as well, which means that there's been less chips available. I'm just talking generally in the yeah. industry. Um, and you know, we've been thinking about that and we've actually, last year at reInvent, we announced capacity blocks, um, which is actually a feature of EC2, which allows you to get access to these chips um, in a way that says, I don't need to actually reserve this chip for its full life cycle, like five years or three years. I can get it for a week. I can get it for a day next week, Tuesday. And so by making sure that that capacity is available and can be shared across the market, um, it's actually allowed a lot of startups and a lot of very large enterprises um, to get access to this technology when and where they need it. And so our capacity blocks offering yeah. is doing incredibly well and I think changed the way that most enterprises consume GPUs. The second part of democratizing it is how do you get the cost at a place where it's affordable. And really the cloud has been doing this, right? I'm thinking all the way back to 2012 and you know, the New York Times indexed <laughs> the entire catalog for like $200 on AWS, something they just could never have done. Yeah. But this idea of like, do I have this compute power to do these you know, larger and larger tasks or things that would just yeah. never have been possible? That's where you know, innovation in custom silicon and competition in the market is really getting to a place where you can use something like capacity blocks to get access to a Tranium that lets you do so much more for the dollars that you're spending that would have otherwise been possible. So you mentioned that just doing that archiving of that index would have been troublesome years ago. Now it's yeah. like instant. Yeah. This brings up the case of like, you know, build it, they will come mentality. You know, there's two sides of the build it, they will come kind of coin. One is you build it and no one shows up. It's like you just built something. And it's like, wait, where's the customers? Yeah. Now you guys in the cloud have a different, you know, scenario because you need, the, you have the horsepower. So yeah. if you build it, they, there's demand for yeah. obviously GPUs. Yeah. Um, but for enterprises, they're trying to build their own potential. Talk about the systems challenge, yeah. uh, because yeah. there's a buy build kind of mindset yeah. going on now around, hey, I'll just stand up a bunch of GPUs and yeah. put them on a rack. Yeah. Oh, I don't have enough power. Or, yeah. hey, I didn't, I didn't use ethernet there. I use InfiniBand exactly. there. Or exactly. uh, there's a lot of expertise that goes into yeah. building these systems. Yeah. I mean, you talk about complex systems. These are clusters. Yep. These aren't like a server on a motherboard yeah. Yeah. and no, throw I mean, some, a, a board yeah. in for an IO adapter. Yeah. It's not a PC. Yeah, and, and that is one of the places that I think we've, we've really been able to differentiate you know, what AWS offers. And it is the complexity of these deployments is just increasing at, a, at an enormous pace. Um, you know, we 
we, we're now doing water cooling in our data centers, which is something we've avoided for a long time. But really, as you get to the, the next generation of chips, which are using more than 1,000 watts per accelerator, uh, which is crazy in itself from a power consumption point of view, you really cannot cool them with air anymore. And now you need to start getting into water cooling, which in a data center is a complicated thing to do. Um, but even just keeping the system stable. How about cooling on the chip? There's a trend. Yeah, so it's water cooling, all, you mean? There's been, I see some MIT ac activity where they're putting actually on the chip itself programmable sensors that say, okay, cool this processor down. Okay, interesting, all the way down to that level. Yeah, and there's gonna be technologies like that and innovations, we're doing a number of different things. Uh, the problem is that you know, the power has gone up so high that now your thermal dynamics become a problem and you've got to find alternative ways to do it. Um, so you know, we're looking at all of that and we're building that, but in terms of complexity, these are the most complicated systems that, that we have to build and trying to do that in your own data center is an incredible challenge. The other thing is once you have the whole thing up and running, um, you, know, you will see failure rates. Um, so you will see accelerators that fail, you'll see servers that fail, power supplies, whatever it might be, you know, uh, optical failures, um, and your workloads are so sensitive to any sort of hardware failure. The, the workloads, these large training clusters actually struggle with any sort of failure, and so you really want to keep those failures uh, to be as small as possible, and then make sure that the whole system can recover quickly if you do see a failure. And that's a place that we've just excelled um, on AWS, and you know, often we have customers say, hey, you're the most stable place to run. And we work hard to make sure that's true. <laughs> Amazon's always had people say, oh, it's never going to work. And it's, yeah. uh, <laughs> it always works. Um, or security was never supposed to be unsecure. Like, oh, the cloud's not secure. Okay, it's more the most secure. Um, Andy Jassy said on his, on his earnings that there's been big growth in Gen AI, seeing some great uptake. I'm imagining that it's only going to be better as you start getting in with the better uh, chips and the better infrastructure because I want to get back to the scenario, say, J.P. Morgan Chase or Amman Enterprise. They got all this data. I want to start turning on these large scale clusters. Um, similar user experience, go to the console and just say, give me a bunch yeah. of GPUs. Yeah. What's the system build look like? If I'm a system architect, I say, hey, you know, I want to index all this stuff. I want to do these systems. Yeah. Is it console based? Yeah. Do you have to do a little thinking? What's yeah. the, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it's actually very straightforward. You know, with, with capacity blocks and EC2, um, we're able to give you that capacity very, very easily. And with the launch of Trainium, um, you're going to be able to go straight to the console and actually get those Trainium uh, servers um, as part of uh, capacity blocks. Now, the good thing about that is when we give you a capacity block, it's actually already using a high-performance elastic fabric adapter network. Mm -hmm. So you know that you're getting those, you know, if you have four servers, you know they actually network together and they're, they're available, um, you know, tightly integrated. Um, we also have SageMaker. Now SageMaker is a service that runs on top of EC2, and what it's doing is actually making it easier for you to run, whether it's a training job or an inference job. So it's gone a little higher up the stack, um, so that you can, you know, we'll take care of much more than just a straight EC2 instance, and customers are enjoying that. That makes your models more stable when you're actually training. I noticed that they repos not repositioned, but made Bedrock the flagship for the models. We changed. We changed our. We changed our stack. We said, "Hey, yeah. Sage." You know, we've always had three layers. We said, "SageMaker is no longer the middle layer; it's now the infrastructure layer," which I think makes more it's sense. It's a shim layer between. It is the shim layer between EC2 yeah. and it was yeah. and, and because it was valuable, it was complicated. It was. It was yeah. Some said it was hard to yeah. use, but well, let's just abstract it away. Bedrock. If you care. look at a customer use case, if a customer is just using EC2 and let's say in using you know, Kubernetes on EKS. They may, they may be struggling with underlying issues with nodes, they may be struggling with some of the stuff with the training model. SageMaker just takes care of all of that for you and makes you more productive. Explain SageMaker as an infrastructure element um, and its role now, so people who, want, yeah. who might not might get confused, because SageMaker was, oh, that was my interface to AI, but it really was just infrastructure. Yeah, Explain uh, what it is in infrastructure yeah, and how it relates. Think to of SageMaker that. as something that has some knowledge about the job that you're running. And so it's a little bit further up the stack, it knows the type of job you're running, you can describe the job, you can provision the underlying EC2 instances, which is what it's using, yeah. and then it's actually managing that job for you. So if there's a node failure or a problem with your cluster, SageMaker is actually doing some work to make it better. Um, and so it's just a little bit so higher it's up like the, the stack. Role of an orchestrator or scheduler would be kind of like yeah. it's a, it's just a, it keeps, it's mission control. Exactly. Because it understands the job, yeah. it's able to think about how the infrastructure yeah. is, you know, set up currently, any failures so that you can complete the job. And then you've got bedrock in the middle layer. Yeah. Now this is where I think you're going to find the vast majority of our yeah. customers uh, is just using bedrock. There's no need with a lot of the models like Claude, um, you know, with Sonnet and Haiku that's available and... Um, so platform engineering is really SageMaker. 
Yeah. Bedrock's more for the user slash developer slash yeah, business I person. I think you're going to find the vast you know. majority of enterprises and customers yeah. are probably going to use a model in Bedrock, be able to use RAG, you know, fine tune the model. Bedrock's got some great yeah. features, but if you need to get down into those details, you know, it's all available in EC2 and all available in SageMaker as well. And it, it speaks back to what you were saying earlier for sort of infrastructure as a service. Like yeah. you get access to all the layers of the stack. So really, you know what? No matter what problem you have, there's the speed option, something like Bedrock. But then there's also the, hey, I want to build this myself option with something on EC2. I think I might have coined a new term called business as code earlier in another interview, but yeah. I like that, that concept because yeah. infrastructure as code brought in DevOps yeah. uh, and APIs connected everything. Yeah. That's a wonderful thing that yeah. creates the cloud. Now you have Gen AI with data connectors yeah. that's native to the application, yeah. not just API. I'm assuming the business as code is like the top layer. Yeah, it's like stack, the queue. Right? It's, it's like Q. Yeah, hey, exactly. Just, like, exactly. <laughs> write me a SQL query because I want to call exactly. I, and just take care exactly. of it. And that is by far the simplest place to get, right? Where you've got queue deployed. It's interesting. I was saying, in, you know, in the, what the cloud did is change the labor equation and that brought in the 10x engineer yeah. and all the goodness of the provisioning uh, being automated away with you guys uh, has created that 10x engineer. Yeah. And that's continuing to power through with yeah. the value you're doing. But now they have a 10x business person. Yes. Because now exactly. you think about like, and people are getting along. It's yes. no more fighting. It's like, hey, yes. I love you. I, my teammate, I love developers. <laughs> hey, can you have the LLM help me do this business? Yeah, yeah no problem. Yeah. Yeah. So like there's a lot of harmonization going on at all layers of the stack. What's the big innovation in your area that you can you can say, hey, with Gen AI, this has made us better, it's forced us to go faster. What are the key things that changed yeah. your roles and, and your, your team's work? Yeah, so we, we've done a few things. I think some of them are customer visible. Um, one of the big ones we went after last year, really two things. Uh, one of them was just providing customers with more insights into their network topology. Um, and as you know, networking is always one of the hardest places. <laughs> if you've got a misconfiguration somewhere, or something creeps in over time, knowing exactly what that We're is. We're hearing about LLM routing now, model routing. I mean, this is exactly. routing. Exactly. Networking is moving up the stack as a concept. Yeah. yeah. So, so we had we built a service called Access Analyzer using automated reasoning and mathematics. It creates a mathematical model of your VPC and able to t reason about the VPC. And so, with this incredible reasoning engine, we introduced generative AI to that yeah. to say, okay, can I ask just any natural language question about my network? And so now you've got this sort of real-time debug capability that allows you to deeply understand your network and debug any issues. Um, we also did, you know, talking about as code, we did console to code yeah. or console as code. So you can take anything in the console um, and actually generate whether you want the command line tools, you want the actual code for that. You maybe did some sequence in the console. We can now give that to you that you can go put in CloudFormation um, or do whatever. Internally, you know, we, we're finding uses for generative AI all over the place, and it's a, it's a journey. I think, you know, similar to what you were talking about with Q, we're using that internally. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we, we're making a lot of progress even in our metrics. You know, how do we, when you do see an issue somewhere, how does generative AI help you actually debug what that issue is? Um, so, yeah, a lot of- We're seeing a huge cases. tech party going on, I'm telling you, and you guys even have a cycle party rock internally. I mean, everyone's yeah. happy yeah. right now. You got yeah. the application, the users are happy. Uh, you've seen a new user interface, the business productivity, business yeah. as code is happening. Yeah. But if you look at what, in your area, and this is a consistent thing I'm seeing for the past year, it's almost like a freak out to me because it's like, I feel like I'm in 1995. <laughs> because it feels like the 90s, because networking and compute and hardware, the area that you're yeah. in, yeah. is not only transformative, it's exciting. Yeah. It reminds me of yeah. like all that excitement of, hey, a new router came out, a new switch, yes. or oh man, yes. a new processor. So like yes. the hardware enablement yes. is driving yes. so much change, yes. and at that time, that yeah. revolution was productivity. Yeah, right? absolutely. PCs. Well, I think I think we are, uh, and we've seen this. You know, it's tied in with a lot of the custom silicon we've done. We are at a point now yeah. where you know the hardware really, really matters again. We kind of we kind of got a little bored of hardware for a while. You know, when the early two thousands, when Moore's law kind of died. Everybody was like, okay, well, you know, we're not going to see that sort of innovation again. I would say the Graviton played a big part in saying, hey, no, you can get 40% performance improvement, 30% performance improvement generation over generation. And then obviously what's happened with generative AI and this whole new area of, you know, accelerators, um, it's a super exciting time. Yeah, well, we, we, and we've had chats early on in, on the Cube career when yeah. you were on earlier, yeah. when you were uh, in the product side. Um, doing product work, James Hamilton also talked about it. Yeah. You know, the Nitro was the was a beginning of a mindset shift of hey, mindset shift of hey, yeah. you know, we have all this gear. Yeah. Let's. I'm mean, obviously calm over simplifying. You yeah. could probably tell the story better, but yeah. that became the, really the the directional like it's like what server what Lambda was. I talked to Werner about this on my interview two days ago. It's yes. like you know, Lambda changed the game because we already had the components. Yes. People were doing it. Yes. Just let's just make it like let's just abstract yes. away. And just new yes. things happen. Yes. Yes. And I think Nitro spawned and then Annapurna, which. Dave and I say hey. the best acquisition in the industry. Yeah. And VMware and, and Annapurna are probably yeah. the two biggest yeah. deals ever done yeah. for, for the price, yeah. value-wise. Yeah. I mean, yeah. 
Uh, yeah. You guys got major. I, so those two points really kind of yeah. set the stage for yeah. this unleashing. I always go back much further. I yeah. go back to like 2007. EC2 is just about the GA. Um, we've been around for about a year, and customers are saying, hey, virtualization is never going to work for us. And the thing back then was actually yeah. jitter. So we called it jitter. And we, we had a meeting every single week um, on how do we reduce jitter, whether that's on EBS for storage. Jitter on the networking side. For people, yeah. Anything. Yeah. So EBS, yeah. networking. And that's the thing that was killing us back in the day was you'd have great performance, but you'd have these excursions of really high latencies. Yeah. And the, the journey of solving jitter we realized we had to go to hardware. And when we realized we had to go to hardware, we found Annapurna Labs. And we started to build these NICs, smart NICs, with ARM processors. And then when you had the ARM processors, we got really good at coding for ARM. And when we got good at coding for ARM, we said, could this be a system processor? And that's where Graviton came from, and then ultimately Inferentia. So you can draw this line. It's just, you know, innovation doesn't happen in a, you know, it's not a eureka moment always. It's this constant focus, and innovation happens over many, many yeah. years. And Steve Jobs said it brilliantly. You never end up where you started, but you kind of get the direction. Yeah. And also, Gen AI has the same playbook where, like Lambda and service and some of the things you mentioned, is that for customers, they just have to get in, knock down some wins. 100% agree. Just 100% agree. And then agree. you'll learn, and you know, okay, yeah. your aperture yeah. increases. And I, I always tell customers, with all this new technology, the best thing you can do is get hands on keyboard and start playing. Yeah. Yeah. Just find some use case. Um, you know, a lot of folks will typically tend to try and do all the estimation. How long do we think this is going to take yeah, yeah. us? And they really have no cost. idea. <laughs> exactly, they're trying to answer all those questions. Give yourself a yeah. budget, get something that you can start playing with yeah. for a reasonable amount of money, amount of money you know, something that's, that's, that's scoped, and, and just start playing with it. And I've seen that with my teams, by the way. When we started playing with generative AI, that's where the networking feature came from. Yeah. We didn't set out to build a networking feature. Some yeah. team just started to play with generative AI, and eventually we had a networking product in a relatively short amount of time. Um, and so I think customers would see the same thing. Yeah, I mean, the slogan build on, as Vern has been saying, it's yeah, been, uh, been exactly. here, reinvent. And reinvent yeah. w uh, is a big takeaway uh, for the market to look at again. Hardware, custom silicon's hot. You guys, you're doing your job yeah. well. Thank you for that. And the industry thanks you. But the data layer's got to come too. Right? Yeah. So ChangeMaker yeah. and Bedrock will kick in. Yeah. What's your big takeaway for reinvent? Uh, what should people take away from the performance increases, the work you're doing? What would you say is the big takeaway for, yeah, you know, from I your think what perspective? I think, uh, you know, certainly on the generative AI side, with what we're doing with, you know, the launch of Trainium 2, and, uh, you know, you'll see a number of benchmarks in, in Matt's presentation um, of how we've been able to move the needle on both performance and price. It's just amazing. It's incredibly exciting. And I think it's opening up, you know, generative AI to more and more of our customer base. Um, you know, obviously, I'm sure you chatted to Swami, and there's so much happening at his yeah. layer as well. Yeah. Um, but then outside of generative AI, you know, you're going to, Peter's keynote, uh, you're going to see a lot about, you know, just the sort of, innovation that's continuing to happen in, you know, whether it's the different layers of the compute stack. And we're going to be announcing some um, incredible things around Kubernetes and what are we doing there to make that, you know, just continuously easier to run and easier to use on AWS. It's like the new Linux. I mean, it is the new Linux. It's yeah, it's boring and reliable yeah. like it should be. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so there's, there's so much innovation just happening you know, broadly across AWS. You know, now it's always fun to talk about generative AI, uh, but I think you're going to hear a lot from us outside of generative AI as yeah. well um, about everything we've been it's doing. It's like uh, everything, um, I always joke, um, someone else said this, but I, I can take credit, for, I'm like, I can't take credit for it. It says, <laughs> everything that happened in Star Trek will be invented. I said, what about, <laughs> the, transpo what about the transporter room? So it's like, well, this is a, this is a tr um, you know, old school Star Trek a engine room. I need, Scott, I need more power. Exactly. Yeah, well, that's true. You're in the yeah. compute business, and this yeah. is, I mean, this is an area of more power in terms of performance but also less power on efficiency, yeah. that's a big deal. Yeah. How should customers think about the, the, the new, the new uh, Tranium 2 in terms of, okay, I could go. What's the go, what's the go plan? Uh, what's the go bag, so to yeah. speak, and saying, okay, I can yeah. use this app for this. Yeah. It's now gettable. How would you, yeah. what workloads, yeah. what use cases does this fit nicely? Yeah. We give some of the confidence. You know, I think the first thing is they're going to get to benefit from Tranium 2 right out the gate just by using you know, the latest Anthropic models, the latest Llama models, and the performance on Bedrock is going to be better than anywhere else just because it's using Tranium 2 behind the scenes. And so that's the easy lift, right? Get the benefit of Tranium 2. AWS has done all the work behind the scenes. You get just the best latency and the best performance and best accuracy. Um, you know, customer looking to actually execute one of these available in capacity blocks, available through SageMaker, um, and you can start using that. Uh, so you know, Anthropic's got a nice edge with you. On, yeah, because on Tranium. we're working very closely with them, and so they've been porting all of their models to actually run really, really well on Tranium, mm -hmm. um, and obviously working to optimize that stack together. How do we get that to be the, just the yeah. best place, best performance um, to access an anthropic model? Um, so you Bedrock know, is a nice lift here too. Bedrock is just so great to use and so easy to use because you know it does all the heavy lifting for you. <laughs> um, the, you're, you're, you like Bedrock. 
I do. I think it's a really good model. I actually think that that's where most customers are going to probably spend a lot of their time just using models that have been built and putting their data. You get so much value so quickly from that. You can certainly get to the lower layers uh, of the stack, and I love it when you want to use EC2, and I love it when you want to use SageMaker. Um, but I think having those different building layer is super important uh, for the. How about the, the jitter and latency between me bedrock and the chips? Um, because that's going to be a concern for folks yeah, to make sure that they that's you know, covered. As we've done with every one of our services, you know, I was talking about EC2 all the way back in 2007, we focus on that. And so you know, that's our problem, to make sure that we're giving you the very best latency and the very best performance. Um, and if, if we are seeing jitter and latency, it's going to be a problem with customer adoption, and so you know we're going to be spending a lot of time getting that right. By the way, EC2, you were working on that at the time. You, yeah. were, you, you, were, the, you were the, yeah. the lead on that. Yeah. By the way, I used EC2 in 2007 before they had custom domain support. Yes. They had that long string URL. Yes. And yes. I had to go to RightScale at yes. the time. It was the only yes. company that would provide any kind yes. of like custom domain. Yes. And uh, yeah. that was early days. Yeah, yeah. 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 I remember that. Yeah. That was Thorsten at RightScale. <laughs> uh, so I was my, on the other side of that, yeah. working, working with RightScale, making sure we run, run yeah. this cloud. Yeah. I'll never forget that. It was, I'm like, I was like, oh my God, this EC2 thing is hot. This is the best thing I've yeah, ever yeah, seen. Yeah. What do you, yeah. it's not even, it's a server. Yeah. I was yeah, like, it wasn't, that, so that, yeah, it wasn't even an instance. Flexing my little then. knowledge of AWS going yeah. back to the early days, yeah. but but that was a game changer moment for the industry. Again, we're just reliving glory yeah. here, but yeah. what it meant was, as I, I was doing a startup at that time, and uh, I think Silicon Angle was at the beginning of that time, pre Silicon Angle, yeah. and I was trying to get this stuff done, and I'm like, I don't, I didn't have to go buy a box. No, and provision exactly. it. Exactly. And dial up and do exactly. remote access. Find a colo, find you know, a like, data like, center. I got to load Linux it on it. it. Oh, damn. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Back then, you yeah. had to load Linux, yeah. provision it. Yeah. So, yeah. Gen AI is going through the same thing, and you yeah. now have silicon tied to performance layers. Yes. So, the new Gen AI stack yes. is tied to the performance yes. here. That's yes. the key strategy yes. here for customers to yeah. look at, right? Yeah, I mean, we have to build to innovate at all levels of the stack if we're going to give customers the performance. Um, if you're going to give them at, at the right price. That's the important yeah. thing, right? It's performance at the right price. And mm -hmm. I think the, the biggest thing that we could do for our customers right now is make sure that we can give them generative AI at a lower price. Um, and that's what we're hoping to achieve. What about people training. who say, hey, you know, I'm going to build my own clusters on premise and I'm going to put Ethernet, Fabric, and have Infinite, and I'll, I'll build my own. Yeah, what, I think it's going to be interesting. I know a lot yeah. of folks are looking to do that uh, for many, many different reasons. Uh, some of them are sovereignty reasons where they believe they need to be on-prem yeah. in certain locations. Um, you know, we've, we've uh, I think it's an incredibly hard lift to, to go and do that. Um, uh, we've, what would be some of the areas of concerns that you, if you were going to point that out, if you were a consultant and say, yeah, hey, I mean, just, the, just, just, well, firstly, just the power. I get yeah. enough power to go and do that. Uh, you know, the amount of power that we use in the space is, uh, it's, it's a lot of power and certainly in smaller data centers to be able to run a meaningful number. Um, obviously the networking, um, and then also just dealing with failures. It's just, you know, the, the whole, the whole, how do you get these things to run really, really efficiently, mm -hmm. where, you know, our numbers are, you know, we constantly, we just have teams of people focused on identifying every single little fault that happens and making sure it yeah. never happens again, and going back to suppliers to say, we think we found this. At scale, at our scale, you yeah. see things that you would never ever see in a smaller yeah, data center. And so you're able to actually, yeah. you're able to go fix all these things yeah. and get it to a better place for your customers. So just stability is generally that. But you know, we have actually. You say, wait till you do your first root cause analysis it's, it's exercise. Really, it's <laughs> really, really hard. And we've spent, you know, what, 18 years at it now. Um, and we've gotten better, but it's been a lot of hard work and we still meet on it every single week with my teams, just making sure that we're at the right place in terms of performance. Okay, so I have to ask the question because I, yeah. you know, I was a big fan of this, but it kind of, went in a different direction, but Outpost was, yeah. I think timing-wise, a little bit off. But if you look at yeah. now, now, you know, I got compute, the compute power exactly. you have now in form exactly. factor, Edge is exactly. huge. Um, exactly. And you got computer vision, yeah. um, which is a killer yeah. app too yeah. on multimodal yeah. cameras. So yeah. image recognition, this is a, like a dream scenario yeah. for compute. Yeah. 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 I mean, in the sense of eating more data. I mean, yeah. compute loves yeah. data. Yeah. And, and that's kind of where I was actually going to go because a lot of those use cases, you know, I said digital sovereignty and yeah. customers want to be in their own data set center sometimes for latency. And Outpost actually is a product that's allowing us to do that. And so, you know, a great example of Outpost is actually the NASDAQ. Um, where we are actually running NASDAQ markets today on Outpost in a data center in New Jersey. Um, and we had to be there for latency reasons. Um, but you know, we do have uh, GPUs available and we will have accelerators available in Outpost if folks need those in you know, edge locations. I mean, I can um, see some scenarios where you have such scale that it's almost um, a barrier to entry for a competitor or alternative. I'll give you an example. You know, um, what came out of the pandemic was Amazon Connect. 
Yeah. Um, why? Yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> people <laughs> weren't yeah. working anymore. Yes. They had, you need, that yes. became a great solution. Yes. Saved everyone's butts, basically. Yes. Yes. It, was, it was a lifesaver for yes. many. Yes, um, absolutely. Connect. And now that's a full service. Yeah. And the scale that Gen AI is kicking in to connect yeah. is going to look at, that's something that it's hard to do yeah. at that exactly. scale. So I can exactly. imagine the compute yeah farm, yeah. if you will, compute capabilities yeah, yeah, yeah. of Amazon, yeah. well, could I be mean, like Connect, yeah. why, not, why not be yeah. providing the edge? Yeah, well Connect is a great example actually of this, you know, the, the benefits that using the cloud really brings, because you know, prior to Connect, and we still have customers today, but they have some sort of PBS on site, and they've got a team of people that manage it, it's hard to run, and it, you don't see the innovation, you don't see the features, yeah. right, that you really get. So with Connect, customers say, hey, let's move all of this to the cloud, let's just run on Connect, yeah. and then you get all this innovation, and it's more highly available and easier, and so we've had some really great success stories with that. I mean, Amazon has all this learnings. I mean, even on the retail, you can be turnkey infrastructure and exactly. say, Here, here's exactly. your retail box. <laughs> exactly. It's yeah. got, and it's got all the yeah. Annapurna goodness, talks to the calls yeah. home to the cloud, yeah. and runs yeah. a high performance yeah. edge supercomputer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, with, yeah. You can, do the takeout stuff and visual. I mean, yes, I mean, yes. this is really kind of lots of room, lots of room for innovation. You didn't even mention you didn't mention Kuiper, you know, satellites in space now. So yeah, I mean, that, that's not the edge. Bring it, that's bring it all. Uh, the world's <laughs> round. That's like space. That's like outer edge. Exactly. <laughs> the outer exactly, edge. Exactly. What's exciting you these days? You got. I mean, you got a great job. I mean, you're. In a, I mean, it's a tough job. I mean, you, you yeah. have a tough department. I mean, you have a lot of pressure. Yeah. But what's exciting you yeah. in, in this job? It's super like, I think valuable. The, op the opportunity is enormous, right? So we've you know we've gotten to. You know, what we do and how we do it hasn't really changed. We're just getting to work with some, you know, some new silicon, uh, generative AI has given us a new area to go and apply really the same things we've been doing all along to this new area. Um, and I think it's the customer innovation, you know, seeing customers starting to kick the tires on generative AI a few years ago, starting to see some of the great use cases that are out there now and customers are already starting to use. And then, you know, obviously knowing about what Dranium 2 can do and, you know, the benefits that I think customers are going to get, whether they're using it in Bedrock, SageMaker, EC2, um, and then, you know, Tranium 3. Uh, I don't know if the name was a secret, but that the next one's Tranium 3, right? <laughs> We're going to be talking about <laughs> that as well. Number. Which is going to give us just even more performance. Yeah. And so there's just no end in sight for the level of innovation that we're yeah. bringing. Um, and internally, we just you know continue to run as fast as we can. My, my last question for you, I know you got to go, appreciate your busy time here yeah. um, in, the, in the Cube. What about um, the role of partners in your world? I mean, ecosystem partners. You got you got Nvidia's out there. You got your own providers. What about uh, and you got Broadcom out there? You got Ethernet yeah. and Ethernet. You got yeah. betting on. I know you yeah. use InfiniBand, but like Ethernet's where the bread and butter. It's where the action. Yeah, we don't we don't use InfiniBand. You don't use InfiniBand no, at all. No, no. But Ethernet. We use so we use Ethernet, and then we actually have a, a protocol called Elastic Fabric Adapter EFA mm -hmm. um, that we. have Developed over many years now, and, and we use that for all of our, our training. So you got, there's other suppliers out there, and su supply chains not infinite. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you, you mentioned that earlier. It's constrained yeah. supply. Yeah. You guys build yeah. your own. What's the role of you guys versus, say, the Nvidia's, the Broadcoms, yeah. Um, yeah. and everyone else out there yeah. that are making uh, silicon and yeah. custom silicon? Yeah. Customer I mean, firstly, you know, folks, folks like Nvidia are a very, very close partner of ours. Um, yeah. You know, the way I think about Nvidia is, I want to say, how do I make Nvidia hardware? How do I make AWS the best place to run NVIDIA hardware? And so, you know, we partner very closely with them in bringing our technology close to their technology. I don't know if you saw Project Sabre. We announced it last year at reInvent, and that's getting very close to deployment right now with the new Blackwell GPUs. Yeah. That's a 20,000 GPU cluster on AWS. Um, so we've been very excited about that. But, you know, from a supply chain point of view, um, the last couple of years have shown us just how many challenges the <laughs> supply yeah. chain can have. Yeah. Uh, even now, I always get asked questions yeah. about, hey, what's the next challenge for the supply chain, whether it's you know, some sort of geographical issue, or it might be you know, yeah. just a shortage in some area, or a co-os, whatever it might be. Build it and hoard uh, those chips and you know, and exactly. build your own to but get the, a differentiation, right? Yeah, the thing with supply chain yeah. is you just have to be really, really good at it. Yeah. And again, it's another scenario where scale really, really helps. And so the scale of AWS means that we're, experience. yeah, we've been running supply chains since we launched AWS, uh, Amazon back in the day, right? It's a <laughs> supply chain business. And so we've benefited a lot from the Amazon supply chain. Um, and then obviously as AWS, we've had to build our own supply chain. And we've learned a lot over the last five years and all the challenges we've a seen. A big theme here at reInvent this year is going to be um, customer loops, feedback loops. Yeah. It's been part of the DNA of AWS. Yeah. Yeah. What's the feedback loop coming in from the market on, on, on the custom silicon, your silicon, partnering with NVIDIA's of the world? Um, what are they telling you? Tie the software advantage here. 
What is, yeah. What's the big feedback so, loop? I mean, the first thing is everything we do. Uh, we, don't, we do not want to build products. You mentioned earlier, to build a product that nobody wants. We do not want <laughs> to do that. Will come. We do not want to do that. We a lot of people do it hoarding the GPU <laughs> saying, hey, I'm going to hold you hostage, maybe, come to maybe, me. Maybe. We, we want to build products. We want to build custom silicon. We want to have software that really solves a customer problem. And then our belief is if we're solving a customer problem, they're going to come. And so you know, there's a lot of excitement around Tranium. Um, we have a lot of excitement around NVIDIA and AWS and what's happening there. We want to make sure we can support all of those workloads, whether a customer chooses NVIDIA or they choose training on AWS. Um, we want to be the best place to support those workloads. So. Awesome. Well, Dave, thank you for coming on theCUBE. Appreciate yeah, it. great. Thank you Good for your time. Good to see you. Congratulations yeah. and uh, love this new chip. Yeah, thank you. I'm going to get my workloads on there and uh, I want to get all of our CUBE data. We only need training one probably for that. <laughs> Congratulations, thanks Great, for coming Great, thanks on. for your time. Okay, Cheers. this is CUBE coverage here. We're in Seattle at the headquarters of AWS called reInvent, the name of the building. I'm John Furrier, your host of the CUBE. Thanks for watching.